Shalom and welcome to In the Beginning Radio Program. I am Wayne Leland, Rabbi of Am Israel Messianic Synagogue in Navarre, Florida. Uh, Rabbi uh, Eric Tokager is not with us today, but his son is Rabbi David Tokager. Welcome to the program today, Rabbi David. Shalom, thanks for having me. And Rabbi David is uh, uh, from the congregation Mayim Kaim in Daphne, Alabama, and he'll share that more with us here in a little bit. Uh, however, I would like to thank Natasha Krauss Reynolds for our opening song, written and produced by Tamara Alexandra and Jonathan Lane. And you can check out uh, more of their music on www.somplace.com. That is somplace.com. Uh, before we get started, I would like to share some of the local communities, the Messianic communities in our area, so that if you would like to visit us, you would know where to go. One of them is Britom Messianic Synagogue. And Bridam meets at 6700 Spanish Trail in Pensacola, Florida. Their Sabbath service starts every Saturday at 10 a.m. And they also have a Tuesday scripture study at 7 o'clock p.m. First century worship in a 21st century world. To find out more about them, you can go to shalompensacola.com. That is shalompensacola.com. And also, uh, our, the congregation that I'm at, Am Israel Messianic Synagogue, that meets at 9255 Military Trail in Navarre, Florida. Uh, to find out more about us, you can go to shalomnavar.com. That is shalomnavar.com or contact me directly at 850-293-4721. Our Sabbath service starts every Saturday at 1 o'clock p.m. And we also have an interactive uh, Bible study on Tuesday nights that starts at 7 o'clock p.m. We'd love to invite you to come out and join with us. If you'd like to find out more about what's going on internationally in the Messianic movement, the Messianic Times is a new source to do so. You can find that on MessianicTimes.com. MessianicTimes.com. And Dave, uh, Rabbi David, why don't you share with us about your congregation? Uh, Congregation Maim Chaim, the Eastern Shores Messianic Synagogue in Daphne, Alabama. We are located at 10526 County Road 64 in Daphne, and our services are on Saturday morning at 10.30 a.m. Thank you, uh, Rabbi David. Also, there's another one. It's called Bayat Israel, South Mobile's Messianic Synagogue. Uh, and that is uh, Rabbi Paul and Reps and Sally would love to have you to come to their services. Their services start on Shabbat, which is Saturday at 11 a.m., and they also have a Tuesday Bible study at 7 o'clock p.m. The address where they meet is 8340 East Rabbi Street, Bayo Labatre, Alabama. To find out more about them, you can go to shalommobile.com. That's shalommobile.com. If you have a question today and you would like to call in, it, the number here is 623-1330, 623-1330. Well, Rabbi David, a lot is happening in the world today. A lot of, a lot of things are taking place within the Messianic movement. Uh, we see our world changing on a daily basis. But the, some good things that are happening is so many people within the Jewish community it's coming to faith like never before. Why don't you share some of the things we were talking about this morning? Yeah, well, there's there's a number of things, and and just to throw it out there, if if any of our listeners haven't seen the website imetmessiah.com, I highly recommend that you go view it. imetmessiah.com. It's filled of testimonials of Jewish believers, primarily businessmen and women, who are sharing their testimony, their story in video form of how they came to faith and what God has done in their lives since they found Messiah. And we're watching through this and many other efforts throughout the, uh, the Jewish world as Jewish people, uh, in many respects by thousands, are coming to faith. Uh, and it, we're really watching this mass revival, if you would, of Jewish people coming to faith in Yeshua as the promised 
Jewish Messiah. Um, and along with that, we're also seeing as the body of Messiah itself is starting to have a yearning, a desire, a passion to return back to an understanding of the Jewish roots of our faith as followers of Yeshua, the promised Jewish Messiah. Um, and internationally, it's growing, and we're seeing a number of things happen from Messianic synagogues numbering, uh, I believe, upwards of 500 plus uh, all over the globe. I think there's about a 300 or so just in the U.S. Uh, Messianic Judaism, as far as the congregational aspect, uh, re revolves around there's actually Messianic synagogues now on every continent on the face of the globe, uh, with exception of Antarctica, only because I don't know that anybody actually lives there. Uh, but aside from that, we're seeing uh, any basically anywhere where, where Jewish people live, Messianic Jewish synagogues, made up and comprised of both Jews and non-Jews are coming together to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the joy found only in the promised Messiah of Israel. And it's a powerful statement to see these things occur across the, the globe. That's really, that's really awesome what's happening, uh, Rabbi David. And, you know, I'd just like to send out a call to our Jewish friends, our Jewish listeners who uh, are in our areas, that it's time to come home to the Jewish Messiah, it's time to come home to the synagogues, the Messianic synagogues in our, that are in our areas, uh, because you know when when you come to faith in Messiah as a Jew, you can still be Jewish. You can still live out your Jewishness. Is that right, Rabbi David? The truth is, the the uh, only way to be fervently connected to the Jewish people is through the Jewish Messiah. All of the Jewish world has been longing for the coming of Messiah, and for the majority of the last 2,000 years, our people have been looking to the wrong coming of Messiah to be first. Messiah already came as the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 uh, in his first coming as Yeshua, God himself robed in flesh, walking on earth in the midst of his people, uh, died, buried, and resurrected to new life, bringing about the opportunity for us to have a atonement and salvation uh, to return to a relationship, a, a, a uh, reunion with our Creator, and will return again as Mashiach ben David, as a victorious King Messiah, yes. coming back to draw us into His kingdom, into His uh, into His world for all eternity, into His embrace, His love, and His very presence itself for all eternity. And so the the reality is, for instance, if you look at Daniel, Daniel speaks of how Messiah must come before the destruction of the temple. And I don't know about you, I was just in Israel a few months ago, and I don't recall having seen a temple standing today. No. So either Mashiach's already come, and had to have come before 70 common era, or he's never coming at all. And I believe in perfect faith, as you do, and yes. as Messianic Judaism as a whole does, that Mashiach has come, Messiah has come in the person of Yeshua, 100% man, 100% God, God himself robed in flesh to tabernacle in our midst and to usher us into the kingdom of his presence for all eternity. Yes, and as Rabbi David just said, uh, he came the first time as what we call Ben Joseph, the suffering servant for the redemption of all mankind to the Jew first and the Gentile. But this next time he comes back as Ben David, the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah to make things right on this planet and to set things in order. And I'm excited and can't wait till that happens, Rabbi David. You know, and with all that being said, with the Jewish people needing to accept their Messiah, and, and they are they're coming. They're coming every day as we're sitting here talking more coming into the kingdom. There's another side that I would like, and I've been sharing this lately uh, and, and speaking out to our Christian brethren who say they believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob too. But it's time for them to come back to his full understanding of the Bible, not some made-up theological teachings that have been sidetracked only from the Brit Hadashai, which is nothing wrong with the Brit Hadashai. It's the understanding because they have not followed the foundation in which our program is called In the Beginning. We need to go back to the beginning and to Genesis and get the foundation laid down. It's time for uh, pastors to realize that we need to quit telling the Easter Bunny story and tell the Passover story because the scripture, whether we like it or not, is intrinsically Jewish. It was given by a Jewish Messiah and we must come back to doing it God's way and not setting up our own form of religious understanding. 
Well, I'm a you know I'm a, a firm believer that I I don't think we serve a God of division and, and disunity. Um, I think that that division comes only from the enemy, uh, and it's his efforts to try and keep the kingdom of Messiah down, to try and keep the followers of Messiah from being as effective as we could be if we came together in fervent unity and the presence of the Ruach Hakodesh, the Holy Spirit. Um, and one of the things that that's interesting is Messiah came as a Jewish person. He came to the Jew first. Uh, even Paul, the supposed to be the, the disciple or the apostle rather to the Gentiles, even Paul, as you read of his journeys, went to synagogues first, ministered in synagogues, tried to share the Messiah in synagogues, and then once he reached all he could in the synagogue, went out to the streets to reach the nations. The, the beauty of the message of Messiah, the beauty of the gospel itself, the Besorah, is that it was for Jew and non-Jew. It was to go to the Jew first, and the Jew was to be what we were originally called at on Sinai to be, which is to be a light into the nations, to carry the truth of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the truth of the one and only God of all creation, to the nations and draw them in. And I don't think that it was ever God's intention for there to be a Gentile church and a Jewish part of the body of Messiah, the Messianic Jewish movement. I think it was always God's intention for there to be his body, and his body would be contained of both Jew and non-Jew. And as you know, is typical when you get humans involved, we tend to mess things up. And I think that over the course of the millennia, um, that what we've seen happen in the last 2,000 years is that we have caused division. We've allowed the enemy to create division. And the truth is, as the scripture says in the Baruch HaDashah, Paul talks about how the, the Gentile believer is to drive the Jew to jealousy for his God. And the reality is, is that the body of Messiah today, as is predominant within the Gentile church, is viewed within the Jewish mind as a completely separate religion. The, the Jewish Messiah has been stripped of all of his Jewish heritage and all of his Jewish culture and, and all of his Jewish relevancy uh, by the church and in essence has been created into a Gentile uh, blonde hair, blue eyes kind of a mentality of the Messiah. And the truth is that the Jewish people see that. They see that, that Christianity serves a separate God. In some cases, they see it as three separate gods. They see that Christianity is a completely separate faith. And there's this this ability that the enemy has has managed to get us to fall in place with division and it has, in essence, created a means that has separated the Gentile believers who are to drive the Jew to jealousy for their God to separate them from the Jewish people to where the Jewish people don't even see their God there. And don't get me wrong, this isn't to say that the, that God has not moved and has not worked through the church. I believe he has, and I believe he will continue to do so. Um, I know that a large number of the Messianic rabbis that I know today have come to faith through the works of the church. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reality is, is God is calling in these days that we live in now, God is calling the body of Messiah back to its roots, its heritage, its foundation, which is foundationally in the, the Jewish heritage of the scriptures and the Jewish context of the Messianic message of Messiah and the reality is that that is what's important and what we're seeing happen as all of this is going on and I've told people before that I, I, I am a fervent believer that as believers whether Jew or non our primary driving force should be to see to want to see Jews come to faith in the promised Jewish Messiah and live Jewish lives as believers in the promised Jewish Messiah because the word says Messiah will not return until all of Israel has been saved mm -hmm. and so so I think if we want to see Messiah return, as many say they do, it's important that we look at things from that perspective, that we want to see Jews come to faith and remain Jewish, not become Christians. And what happens a lot of times is a Jewish person becomes a believer in a church, and the church says, oh, you're no longer Jewish. All that Jewish stuff doesn't matter. Okay, yeah, you believe in the Jewish Messiah, that's all fine, but, that, but that's it. All the Jewish stuff is all done away with, and you're now part of the church. You're now a Christian. Um, yeah, because God changed his mind somehow or another. Yeah, he changed his mind or he's, he's, he's schizophrenic or something. I don't know. It just doesn't make sense. But the reality is, is what I see happening today. And if we look, as we were speaking earlier this morning, if we look historically at the rise of Zionism in the late 1800s, as the rise of Zionism began, so did a return of Jewish believers to the Jewish world, a return of Jewish believers being proud to be Jewish, Jewish believers who were saying, oh wait, we didn't stop being Jewish to 
accept Messiah, we are actually more Jewish because we accepted Messiah, or we've got a better yearning and desire, a better passion for Judaism because we accepted Messiah. And so in the late 1800s, as the rise of modern Zionism began, so did the rise of Jewish believers returning to their Jewish heritage. Um, and then from there, you move forward into the 19, early 1900s as you had more and more Jews from all across the globe returning back to Eretz Israel, the promised land, the land of Israel. As you see this happening, you start to see this rise of Jewish believers starting to grow more and more, and you see Jews coming to faith more and more in a Jewish context of salvation. And then we moved to 1948. 1948, we see the reestablishment of Israel as a Jewish homeland. And shortly thereafter, we start to see even the nomenclature of these Jewish believers returning to their Jewish heritage change from Hebrew Christians to Messianic Jews, even restoring our Jewish identity and what we call ourselves. And in the 50s, we start to see the rise of the Messianic Jewish congregation kind of sp uh, spawning all over the place. They had been around some, but under the, uh, different auspices started to arise, started to return to a Shabbat service service and have more of this context of a, a Jewish service with the joy, the passion, the love of Messiah in it. And then we moved to 1967. And in 1967, Jerusalem came into the hands of the Jewish people, again became the capital of the Jewish, Jewish homeland of Israel again. And all of a sudden, uh, in the midst of all of this, we see the Jesus movement explode. We see in the 60s and 70s the, the, uh, this revival, this mass revival occur in which thousands by thousands of Jewish people were coming Amen. to faith and as these thousands of Jewish people were coming to faith we also see the rise of the synagogal movement of the Messianic Judaism begin to, begin to grow and expand yes. and move to which today we have some 300 in the US some 500 plus uh, probably a lot more than that that we, we aren't necessarily aware of yet internationally we see the rise of Messianic Jewish organiza organizations like the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America congregational organizations like the International Alliance of Messianic Congregations and synagogues, the union of Messianic Jewish congregations. We start to see the rise of Messianic Jewish uh, outreach organizations like Chosen People Ministries and Jews for Jesus and... Uh, uh, um and uh, Jewish Voice Ministries International and, and a number of others, Reach Initiative International and so on. These movements that are really uh, growing, these organizations that are growing to spread the message to where today, as I mentioned earlier, things like IMetMessiah.com can stand and boldly proclaim the message of Messiah, which to the point, the two of the, the founders or two of the, the leaders involved in this uh, IMetMessiah.com uh, have actually received death threats from the Orthodox Jewish community in Israel. They live in Israel and they've received death threats because of the impact that it's having. It's starting to stir things in yes, the world that we amen. live in. It's starting to stir things spiritually and the enemy is starting to see as more and more Jewish people come to faith, he's starting to see his days become numbered. And he has spent 2,000 years trying to keep the body dissected and dichotomized and, and division uh, breeding throughout the, the body so that we wouldn't see unity and we wouldn't see Messiah return because the longer he could keep Jewish people from coming to faith the longer he could rule and reign here on earth and what's happening now is he's losing ground because more and more Jews are coming to Amen. faith more and more Gentile Christians are starting to go there seems to be more to this faith in Messiah there seems to be more to him being Jewish than what I've always known and dig deeper into the roots and as such more Jews are starting to see the light more Jews are coming to faith and because more Jews are coming to faith they're now taking the light of Messiah out to the nations and they're bringing the light to the nations as we were originally called to do Amen. in the first place and the cyclical process that was founded by the, the, the Ruach HaKodesh the Holy Spirit of God his voice itself speaking this into existence is now beginning to gain ground and being birthed in powerful ways and because of this, we're seeing what we know to be the end of days approaching, uh, however short or fast, I don't know, but we're seeing these things approach. We're seeing prophecy begin to happen and occur before our eyes. And we're seeing that the enemy's losing ground and losing his foothold upon the body of Messiah's throat. And so now he's doing other things, trying to diminish. But we know that Messiah's coming. We know he's Amen. coming back soon. And we can see it in how many Jewish people are coming to faith today and how effective the Messianic Jewish movement is becoming because of that. Yes, you know, Robert David, I believe what you're talking about is what's referred to in the book of Acts as the restoration of all things. We don't need another reformation. We need a full restoration. And I would like to read just a couple of scriptures quickly from the book of Acts, chapter 3, starting with verse 18, concerning the things that Rabbi David and I are talking about. It says in verse 18, But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Messiah 
should suffer. He has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and return that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of the restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. And I believe this move within the Messianic movement, the restoration of uh, the Jewish people coming to faith and the Messianic rabbis coming on the scene, are, is, is bringing about, this is an exciting time, it's bringing about this restoration that's talked about in, in the book of Acts that we're living in today as we sit here and we talk about it on the radio program. We're living in this time and we're seeing this take place. And it truly is an awesome time that we're living in. And so that's why the call for salvation is going out to the uh, Jewish community. They're receiving their Messiah. And that's why the call is also going out to the what we're referring to as the Christian community is really only one body, Jew and Gentile together, for them to come back to the full understanding and full faith. And, you know, I often remember seeing in signs on different church buildings from time to time, here we preach the full gospel. The problem is they don't even really know what the full gospel is. So that full gospel of the kingdom is being restored through this movement. It's a really exciting time that we're, we're living in. I want to remind the, uh, the listeners that you can call in, if you like, at 623-1330. Call in 623-1330 if you have a question that you would like to ask us. Rabbi David, would you please continue this on because this is really powerful what we're talking about. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I'm, and I'm sure Rabbi Eric and, and yourself have spoken of this before, but one of the things that I think is important, and I, I kind of tell people this half-heartedly joke, Joking uh, in our congregation is that if you have a Bible that has a blank page between the end of Malachi and the beginning of, of, of Matthew, you should rip that blank page out. Yes. Because it's, there's no dichotomization in the Word of God. There's no old versus new. As a matter of fact, even the terminology of Old Testament versus New Testament is, I, I think we should throw those terms out. Um, we have the, the Tanakh, which is the Torah, the Nevi'im and the Ketuvim, the, the Torah, the instructions of God, Genesis mm-hmm. through, through Deuteronomy. And then we have the, the Nevi'im, the prophets. And then we have the Ketuvim, the writings, the mm-hmm. words of wisdom and so on and then we move from there into the Brit Chadashah the, the, uh, the new covenant writings the renewed covenant writings but from Genesis to Revelation we have one book the word of God and there's no dichotomizing there isn't old versus new there is God's word and everything from Genesis to Revelation points us in the same direction and that is to Messiah Yeshua is our atonement sacrifice for salvation and his name alone shall bring it um, and, and there is no old versus new there is no this was the Jewish Bible and this is the Christian Bible. There is the Word of God. As a matter of fact, even down to Malachi being the end of the Old Testament in many translations is just an effort uh, years back to try and undermine the Jewishness of the text. And this idea a rose of replacement theology that that God was done with the Jewish people done with Israel that that the, the Gentile church has replaced Israel as God's chosen people and so on and so well you, you really can't you really can't have that begin in Matthew you can't have the beginning of this replacement of Israel in Matthew if the Tanakh the Old Testament ends with Mal- uh, with uh, Chronicles as it does in the proper order because Chronicles ends with a blessing over Israel yes so what happened was they went okay well, we got to restructure this real quick because mm-hmm. if we're gonna if we're gonna sell this we've got to sell it right we've got to sell the curse over Israel at the end of the, the Jewish Bible so they reworked it and they moved Malachi to the end because it was perceived that Malachi ends with the curse over Israel and then you can move into the foundations of the church and they put a blank page dichotomizing the two and then the foundations of the church but the reality is <clears throat> excuse me if you read the end of Malachi Malachi doesn't actually end with a curse Malachi actually ends up ending with a blessing over Israel a promise of restoration yes. uh, of Israel which is funny because all the way through the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah almost all do. Exactly. Isaiah and Jeremiah, before the destruction of, of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, before the Babylonian captivity, as they were prophesying that these things were going to come, there was always a message of destruction is coming, but if you just repent 
I'll stay that destruction. I'll stay that punishment. I'll stay that judgment. And I will draw you back unto myself as my people. And I will be your God, as this week's Parsha in Exodus uh, constantly says, uh, you will be my people and I will be your God. And so there's this idea there. And so the reality is, is that the enemy has done very well, or rather we've done very well at letting the enemy do what he wants, running rampant in the midst of, of the body of Messiah, causing division, causing destruction, causing all of these things that hinder the message of Messiah. I mean, there are thousands upon thousands of denominations, many of which are divided over some of the most petty things, many of which are divided over things that are just a matter of opinion on how we interpret Scripture. How about we come together in unity and the thing we can agree upon, which is the blood atonement of Messiah, Amen. that there is one way to salvation, and we build from there, as opposed to being so willing to divide over so, so little things. Let's build on what matters. Um, if you look... This is one of the things I've been, been teaching a lot in our congregation lately, is if you look in Acts, Acts 1 and Acts 2. Acts 1 is post the, uh, the, the resurrection and the, the ascension of Yeshua. Acts 2 is, is the outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh. If you look just before uh, the beginning of Acts 2, just before the, the outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh, after Yeshua had ascended, and the, the Talmudim, the disciples, gathered together, what they did, Acts 1 says, is they gathered together and worship prayer, fasting, the teaching of the disciples, so on and so forth. And then Acts 2, the outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh. Then he moved to the end of Acts 2, and it says that they gather together with the disciples for worship and prayer and the teaching of the disciples and in unity and worship and, and so on. There really wasn't a big difference between the end of Acts 1 and the end of Acts 2. But there was a difference in the response to because the end of Acts 1, they just added a new disciple from the midst of those that were already there. But the end of Acts 2, it says that there were thousands added in one day and there were hundreds added daily thereafter. And the difference was that the power of God right. was moving in their midst. Yes. And I think we're in a day now, and, and I spoke of this yesterday at our synagogue, we're in a day now where we have to let the power of God move. We have to allow the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit of God, move in our midst. Or else we will not see something. It's not about our apologetics. It's not about how we can preach. It's not about how well we've memorized Scripture. It's about letting the power of God move so that yes. people see God in our lives before they ever hear God come out our mouth. It's about us getting out of the way so God can move. And you know, I rem I'm reminded, you know, and in, in, in the Scripture it talks about in Israel there's uh, the spring... Uh, festival and the fall festivals is the the latter uh, the early rain and the late rain, and that's a reference also to the outpouring of the ruach. You know, I believe we're in the time of that latter rain is beginning to get ready to fully pour out because there are men of God who are submitting themselves to allow the Spirit of God to begin to move in their congregations and and show up. Listen for the voice of God to do what he says and allow him to move. And I think we're just on the verge of seeing a real powerful outpouring of the Spirit of God. And you know, uh, right before we come on the program here, Rabbi David, there's this uh, new new uh, program called Born to Win that I, I've been kind of intrigued with listening to this. Uh, I assume he's a pastor speak lately. I, I don't know what all everything he believes, but so far for the last several weeks, it's a new program. He's been saying what we've been saying. So I don't know if he we agree with everything yet or not, but that's just another indication that some of these pastors are waking up and beginning to tell the truth to lead their people back into that covenant relationship with God, uh, doing and acting like the Jewish Messiah. We're supposed to imitate Messiah. Paul said, you can imitate me. And Paul, or Shaul, Paul, the apostles, could say that because he said, I imitate Messiah. When we get to where we can tell people, you can imitate me because we imitate Messiah, that would be okay. That's where we really all need to be. And, you know, a lot of times, uh, people who are, uh, a lot of the people that are coming from the nations, from the Gentiles, who are, who are leaving the, the Babylonian system, so to speak, and coming into the Messianic congregations and, and, and movements, uh, are being accused of, oh, have you turned Jewish yet? Well, you know, you and I both know you're either born Jewish or you're born Gentile. And because you come to a full understanding of Messiah and you come to the synagogue doesn't make you turn into a Jew. However, the idea of the fact that we're actually beginning to really do what Messiah told us to do in the Word of God, in their mind makes it appear as though we're, we're, uh, the Gentiles have become Jewish. Yeah, and part of that is that there's this idea that that if you strive to honor the Word of God that you're you're going under the law mm -hmm. or you're becoming legalistic. And, and the reality is that the word Torah doesn't mean law. 
it does include law yeah. for Israel, but it doesn't mean law. It means instructions. Uh, it means teachings. It's 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 the the instructions God gave us to be kedoshim, to be holy ones, righteous ones before Him, to be zedachim, righteous ones. And in order to to honor them, and and this is the fact of the matter is when the Torah was given to Israel. Uh, Israel walked in a uh, attempt to observe the Torah, but they were never very good at it. They they never honored it fully, and the reason why is because you can't honor the Word of God unless the Spirit of God, Amen. <coughs> excuse me, unless the Spirit of God that inspired those words resides within you. And so, as the gentleman before us was speaking, the the program you mentioned that was on before us was speaking, he was talking about Peter's vision in Acts 2, but he also briefly talked uh, and, and kind of uh, alluded to Yeshua teaching, and he said, you know, you've heard it said it's a sin to commit murder, but I say if you've even hated somebody, you've already committed it. You've yes. heard it say it's a sin to commit adultery, but if you've even lusted, you've already committed it. The reality is both murder and hatred, both uh, lust and adultery were dealt with in the Torah. There were commands not to hate, there were commands not to lust, just like there were commands not to commit adultery or fornication and not to commit murder. Those commands exist. It wasn't like he was teaching something new, but what he was teaching was that for every external or physical command there's also an internal or spiritual yeah, command amen. and he says if you let me the messiah himself the ruach HaKodesh, which res- inspired these words to reside within you to put that jeremiah 31 new covenant upon your yes. heart no longer just on stone and on parchment but written upon your flesh itself if you let me put that within you then the external can't sin because i've got the internal under control he says if you let me make sure you're not lusting and hating you can't commit adultery and murder you can't commit fornication and murder it's all letting the out the inside flow outward not ma- living the outward in a manner that makes people think the inward's okay you know i waited tables in restaurants for years and i would have people call me over to their section and say hey you know this table wants to talk to you i'd go over and they would see me with my kippa on with my my tzitzit and my beard or whatever and they go are you are you an orthodox jew and I'd say, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not Orthodox. Uh, I'm actually a Messianic Jewish rabbi. And they'd say, oh, you're, you're Messianic. Oh, I see. I could sense there was something different about you. I could see it. There was something different about you. And it would open up opportunities to minister and to share because they saw the Spirit of God in me before they ever heard the words of God come forth from my mouth. And I think that's what Yeshua was getting at when he was teaching verse, murder versus hatred, adultery versus lust, is there's an internal, if we let him handle the inside, the outside, I can't stand if we try to emulate who he is if we try to be messiah like which in essence is what the term christian means is to be christ like to be messiah like if we're striving to be messiah like why do we work so hard build theology so strong build doctrine so uh so so strong that makes us not like christ that makes it wrong to live like christ to live like messiah if our desire is to be messiah like why don't we live like messiah and you know, the interesting thing is, Rabbi David, is because the Bible says that the letter killeth, but the Spirit maketh alive. The reality of the law or the Torah, the instructions given, is a death sentence without the Spirit of God inside us, yep. empowering us to live it out. And that's the great news, and the good news of the Brit Hadashai. It's the good news of what Messiah came, and he became that permanent sacrifice once and for all, allowing... Those who receive him to also receive the power and anointing of his yeah. spirit. It took place on Shavuot, or what we call Pentecost. It's available to everyone who believes now, and that is the power source that makes what would otherwise be a dead word a living word, empowering us to live this out. Yeah, yeah. The 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 beauty of it is. Uh, like I said earlier, you can't honor the Torah without Messiah in your heart, without his spirit in your heart. Um, and the the reality is, is if you're trying to keep Shabbat because you feel like you have to, or if you're trying to eat kosher because you feel like you have to, or if you're striving to not commit adultery or to not commit murder because you feel like you have to, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. If you're not doing it because the Spirit of God's moving on you. And I have people in my synagogue that are all the time asking me, you know, well, look, you know, God's doing this in my life. He's brought me to this Messianic synagogue. How come my family's not coming in? How come my family's up against me as I try to talk about this? How come my family? And I tell them, look, 
you weren't on board with this before God started touching your heart about it, before the Spirit began to move in you in this direction. You can't expect that they're going to be on board with it before the Spirit moves in their, in their hearts in that direction. You have to live your life for Messiah in the way Messiah has called you to live it so that it impacts their hearts and their lives, so that they see the truth of what living the Word of God, not just the Torah, not just the New Testament, but Genesis through Revelation, living the Torah uh, or the Word of God as a whole out in your life, living this example, this emulation of Messiah out in your life in a way that it impacts people's lives so that they want what you have. And you have to do it through the leading of the Spirit of God. If it builds argument, if all you ever get into is arguments with people, then odds are you're trying to get them to do something for the wrong reasons. But if it brings about a true and a deeper understanding, and, and, and you got to listen, I'm, I'm Jewish. Uh, my family's Jewish. As Jewish people, we have a joke that says where there's two rabbis, there's three opinions. <laughs> we argue for fun. And there's a healthy argument. There's a healthy yes. discussion. But then there's those discussions where you know rage is building up, and those just are not okay. But when you're in a discussion with somebody and there's growth, there's going to be debate back and forth, and that's okay. Yes. But there's also going to be growth coming from those debates. There's going to be some sort of a base of understanding between mutual understanding between the two parties that comes from it. And if that's not there when you're talking to somebody about where God's brought you to in terms of how you live out his word to its fullness, uh, then, then that discussion is not healthy. But as God starts to work on your family and your friends' hearts based off of what he's done in your heart and what they're seeing in your life and the changes in your life, all of a sudden those discussions become healthy and they become beneficial and you come to a mutual understanding and you're able to benefit each other in bringing each other deeper in this walk with Messiah. And that's that idea of milk to meat. And it's not just, oh, listen, God called me to, to honor the Shabbat, honor the Sabbath. And I think you have to because this is what the Word of God says. We have to do this. And although the Word of God does say it, but if somebody's heart's not there, they're doing it for the wrong reasons. And it is legalism. And, and so we have to understand that legalism isn't honoring the Word of God. Legalism is when we do it to try and earn something. Yes. I don't honor the Word of God. I don't keep Shabbat and keep kosher and so on because I'm trying to earn anything. My salvation was given freely to me because of the blood of the Lamb which was poured out for my sins. And that's it. There's no other way unto the kingdom of God except through the person of Yeshua. That is it. Bottom line, done. There's no other discussion. Everything else that I do, I do because of the leading of the Ruach HaKodesh because out of everything that God has done for me, the very least I can do is honor Him. The very least I can do is to strive to obey His Word as best I can by the leading of His Ruach HaKodesh. And if we're doing it for any other reason, we're doing it for the wrong reasons. We're doing it in the wrong manner and in the wrong way. I look at Matthew 5 where Yeshua says, those that teach others to keep the greatest of these will be the greatest. Those that teach others to keep the least of these will be the least. The way I look at it is, at least you're in the gate. If you're okay with nosebleed seats, at least you're there. Uh, I don't want to settle for the least. I want to. I want. I want everything God's got in store for me. And if that means that by the leading of the Ruach Hakodesh, that I can be blessed more by honoring more of His Word only by the leading of His Ruach, though, then I'm all for it. I want to have everything God's got in store for me. Not only do I want to earn, have everything God's got in store for me, it's not about earning it. It's about receiving it. Not only do I want to have everything He's got in store for me, but I don't want to rob God of the blessings that He wants to give me. Amen. Well, you, you know, Rabbi uh, Rabbi David, uh, all this these there's terms like uh, Judaizing and legalism that we're talking about here. The, the problem with it is, is that most people who are using those terms, uh, they're coming first of all from an anti-Semitic spirit, and second of all, they're coming because they really don't even really understand what they mean. Just like you talked about legalism, God's Torah is never legalism. Uh, it's man's traditions that have been added and fences that have been added from Christianity as well as Judaism that has created legalism in of itself when they say, Well no one can keep those six hundred and thirteen laws in the in the Old Testament, so to speak, or, or in the Torah, and the reality of it is they're, they're not for everybody anyway. Some's for women, some's for men, some's for priests, on and on and on. But the reality of what you was talking about a while ago was that when Messiah came, he brought it from uh, thou shalt not from the from from the outward to the inward, the spiritual impact of uh, if you don't come, if you don't physically murder somebody, but you talk about them and run them down, you murder them spiritually. And so the reality is, it went from six hundred thirteen to about thousand, to about to about a thousand and uh, 
and 50. Yep. So we got to realize that, and that's and, a shock to most of them yeah. when we talk about that from the spiritual and, impact of it. And every single one of those 1,050 mm-hmm. either reiterate, further illustrate, or completely replicate one of the commandments yes. from the Torah. And we're going to continue this conversation in a minute, but first we want to welcome Seth. Seth, welcome to the call. Oh, shalom, Rabbi Wayne. Shalom, shalom. Rabbi David. Shalom. Long time no hear you, Rabbi David. How are you? <laughs> good, to, good to hear you. I got a question for you by people I've talked to about Messianic synagogues. First of all, they don't know what it is, so it gives you an opportunity to just talk about what it is, you know, and, and but they think that somehow it's more designed, uh, that this Messianic movement is more designed for Jewish people than it is for, quote, non-Jewish or Christian people. And I wonder if you could address that, and uh, I'll just hang up and listen, okay? Okay, right. well, I'm, I'm going to say a couple of things, and I want Rabbi David to, to really fill in all the blanks, because I'm going to work him hard today while he's here. And uh, first of all, the word synagogue comes from a Greek word, synagogue, and it simply means a meeting place. So naturally, to most people, when they hear the word synagogue, and for the most part, today it's true, uh, and in the past has been true. Uh, it, it's all, automatically in their minds it's always Jewish, but it's a Greek term of a meeting place, uh, just as a quote church house would be a meeting place. And a meeting place, a synagogue could be in our home. It could be actually a building built specifically for a meeting place for worship, or it could be uh, it could be different places that we could go to to worship uh, and to speak. Uh, however, it being only for Jewish people, the Scripture makes it clear everything's to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. That's God's order. Uh, you'll have to talk to God about that if you don't like the way He set it up. But that's his, that, that's the setup. But there, uh, again, the reality is too is in the synagogues. Usually, it's about uh, it's about ten to one, David, where there's always more Gentiles than Jewish people. And if you follow the Book of Acts and you just forget everything you've ever been told about what the Book of Acts says, go back and read it for yourself. And look every time and write down every time the word synagogue is used and every time the word church is used. But in doing so, understand that the word church has been added. It was ecclesia from the Greek and not church. And it meant the assembly, the assembly that met in the synagogues. Okay, with that being with that being said, I'm going to let Rabbi David put his part onto this. And with that, in the Greek translations of the Tanakh, Ecclesia was used in in place of uh, or in translation of Kehila uh, or congregation mm-hmm. gathering place in the Hebrew. Um, so the the reality is even in the Greek words of Ecclesia and Synagoge, they were very much a Jewish context as the rest of the scriptures were. Um, so let's look real quick at the idea of whether or not Gentiles belong in a Messianic synagogue uh, versus it being specifically for Jews. And and I would say first off, that's just wrong. Um, Messianic synagogues, I believe, like I said earlier, I don't believe that God's intention was for to be a divided body of Messiah. And if we look in the book of Acts, if we look throughout the, the journeys of Paul, if we look through the, the letters of Paul, there seem to be Jewish communities, uh, Jewish worship communities for believers that were made up of both Jew and non-Jew, very much like a modern-day Messianic Jewish synagogue. As Rabbi Wayne was saying, most Messianic synagogues today are predominantly populated by non-Jews, by Gentiles in the synagogue. Um, and uh, you know, typically somewhere between 20 and 40% of the actual congregation is actually Jewish. And I think that this is absolutely a biblical, a biblically mandated idea for the body of Messiah. If we look all the way back to the book of Exodus, as Israel was coming out of Egypt, it says a mixed multitude left with them. In other words, uh, some estimates are that there were upwards of 5 million people that left Egypt with Israel uh, that made up a part of the nation of Israel. The scripture tells us there were 600,000 men, so let's assume women and children along with that. There's maybe a million and a half or so of those of that estimated upwards of 5 million people. There's maybe a million and a half of them that were actually blood-descendant lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The rest were non-Jews. 
So let's assume, let's just round it off to two million people. So two-fifths of this group of people that left Egypt, best case scenario, two-fifths of them were actually blood descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The other three-fifths, or the majority, were non-Jews, were Gentiles, who left for the single purpose of serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and went to Mount Sinai, heard the voice of God speak forth the ten words. And as they heard the ten words, the ten commandments spoken forth, they said to Moses and to Adonai, we will do everything that you have said or you have asked of us. So it was a mixed multitude. Then we move forward to the Brechad Hashah. And, and hold in mind that in, in the Torah, Israel was commanded to be a light unto the nations. Uh, or Legoim, a light unto the nations. Our purpose was to take the faith of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to take the Torah to the nations and bring the all of God's creation in unity and restoration and relationship with the, the Creator. And so if we move into the, the Brechad Hashah, the New Covenant writings, uh, what's often called the New Testament, what we see is this same aspect of faith is carried out throughout the book of the the books of the Brachad uh, the book of Acts just looking at Acts 15 Acts 15 is often misquoted and people say well these four things that the, the disciples spoke of are the only things that Gentiles have to keep and the reality is is all four of them have to do with one specific thing it has to do with pagan worship and that's it so if we look at Acts 15 verse uh, verse and, 19 and that's the same thing that was given to the Gentiles coming yeah. to faith in the Torah exactly if we look at Acts 15 verse Verse 19, it says, Therefore I judge not to trouble those among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but to write to them to abstain from the contamination of idols and from sexual immorality and from what is strangled, or food that is strangled, as most translations say, and from blood. For Moses from ancient generations has had in every city those who proclaim him, since he is read in all the synagogues every Shabbat. So Acts 15, there's these four things, but they all seem random and arbitrary for these four random commandments of the Torah to be there. But the only way that they're arbitrary is is if we look at them as individual things, but instead we look at them in the culture. These Gentiles were coming from paganism. As they were coming from paganism into a Jewish context of worship, they had to get rid of these pagan practices, drinking blood, sleeping with temple prostitutes, so on and so forth, was a part of pagan worship. They were coming into a Jewish context of worship, in essence, into a first century Messianic Jewish synagogue, and were becoming a part of what was happening. And so as all of this was going on, they were becoming part of the Jewish context of worship. And in this first First century body Messiah were both Jew and non-Jew coming together to worship in the joy of the promised Jewish Messiah. And this is what Messianic Judaism is today, is first century Judaism in the 21st century world. Well, Rabbi Eric, welcome to the call. We, I guess we can let you, you ask the question. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Great. How are you? I'm doing well. I actually had a comment and, uh, to go along with the best question, which I thought was really important is in the United States when you talk about Messianic congregations as Rabbi David said earlier you have a group that's you know between 10 percent 40 percent of the congregation is Jewish which is a pretty amazing thing when you think about it because of the small amount of Jewish people there really are uh, they're always as long as there's a body made up of Jews and non-Jews outside of Israel it's going to be a majority non-Jewish because of the amount of uh, Gentiles the versus Jews just in statistics. Yes. So it's not that you, that there's a uh, a small group of Jews and a large group of Gentiles in a congregation, so that doesn't make it Judaic or Messianic Judaism, but from the very foundation it's been Jews and Gentiles, and when you're in an area like the United States where there's a small percentage of Jews, and a large percentage of Gentiles, it would just make sense that as God was drawing people into this unity of the body, that there would be more Gentiles in the in the group than there are Jews, just by the statistics of it. Amen. And you know the prophet, the prophet clearly made it clear that uh, there would be ten of the nations are going the Gentiles who run up and grab the seat seat of a Jew and said. Teach us God's ways. I'm paraphrasing it, but teach us God's ways. Let us go with you. Learn his ways. Just as actually Rabbi David was just reading from verse 21 that Moses is taught in every city throughout the world, in the synagogues, every Sabbath, there, there they're going to learn the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would put it. After the four Absolutely. things, they're going to learn the rest of the story. Yeah, it's also interesting when we talk about the books, the Pauline epistles, that many of them, for instance, Colossian, when he's reading... Uh, writing where it says uh, not to judge people in 
Sabbath days and new moons and things, that he's actually writing that uh, to Gentiles and saying, you used to observe and worship elemental spirits and false gods and things. Don't return to that. Uh, because there's so many Gentiles that were coming into the synagogues and had to be taught to leave their paganism outside of the yes. synagogue and outside of their faith and to follow the biblical. Yeah, and the verse you particularly brought up actually says, do not judge people for keeping Shabbat and the feast and the new moon. And so the idea there he's speaking is, don't, you know, you, this is supposed to happen. You're supposed to be doing this. And a lot of times people look at that and say, don't judge people for not doing these things because see, Paul's saying it's perfectly okay. But the actual text says, don't judge people for doing this because this is what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, because what right. was happening was, what was happening was a lot of the Gentile friends, the people that they knew, or maybe even family members, we don't know who they were, was trying to pull them back into the old way. Yeah, you know, the the guy that was on before us, the program that was on before us that you referenced, uh, he was speaking particularly about Peter's vision in Acts 10, mm -hmm. which is often taken out of context and to deal with food and so on, but that's not actually what it deals with. And as he so aptly put it and, and was actually very, very on point with it, is it had to do with one single purpose. Mm -hmm. And Peter realized what that purpose was when he stood before Cornelius and Cornelius' household. Prior to that, he was still confused on it, but he was ready to go. And it had to do with Peter was a Jew's Jew. Peter didn't like Gentiles. He wouldn't go to a Gentile's house because problem. that was tradition of the day. But here God had brought this Gentile, Cornelius, into the fold and said, I want you to go get Peter, who hates Gentiles, or bring him to your house to preach to you on a house full of Gentiles. And so right. God had this vision that he gave him. He revealed this thing to him and said, don't call anything I've made clean unclean. The next thing that Peter knows, there's a knock at his door, and he's going to a Gentile's house. He preaches the message of, of Yeshua to them. They all come to faith. The Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, is poured out upon the entire household. They begin to speak in tongues. They begin to prophesy. They begin to see great things happen. And immediately following that, Hallelujah. Peter goes, oh, I get it now. This is about Gentiles are clean by the blood of Messiah, the same yeah. way that Jews Amen. are clean by the blood of Messiah. Absolutely. It's also important to go along with that, that the word <laughs> unclean is used there, not unrighteous. Yeah. Yes. Because the prohibition, although there isn't a commandment that just says Jews can't eat with Gentiles or Jews can't go into Gentile houses, there was a cleanliness issue as it applied to being able to go into the yeah, temple, temple and to be able to make sacrifices and offerings to certain things yeah. that contacting Gentiles would keep you from being able to do. So the reference there isn't that God made all Gentiles righteous, but he made all Gentile believers, uh, people uh, clean to be able to be fellowshiped with so that the gospel could be shared in, with them. Exactly. Amen. And Good it's point. a completely different message than what the body of Messiah has given for the last 1,700 years. Uh, Absolutely. And, the, and the only way, and this is true for the entirety of the Brich HaDashah, the only way one can truly understand the Brich HaDashah, which, by the way, was written by Jews, with exception possibly of Luke, Acts, and maybe Hebrews, if you think that Luke wrote Hebrews, with exception of Luke and Acts, the writings of Luke, who many people say was, at best case scenario, a, a convert to Judaism. Um, I actually also think he was very much likely a, a Jewish person himself that was also a major part in the academic world. But either way, he was either uh, born Jewish or he was a proselyte of Judaism. So even with that exception, the entirety of the Brachadashah, the New Covenant writings of the New Testament, was written by Jewish hands, written in a Jewish context, written from Jewish people to both Jews and non-Jews to understand. Jews. Correct. To, Just like to, the prophets were Messianic. Exactly. For, for non-Jews and Jews alike to understand. And the only way you're going to understand it is in a Jewish context. You have to look at it in both context of the passage, the chapter, the book that it's written in, as well as historical context, as well as context within the overarching message of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Well, I'm going to hang up. You guys are doing a great job today. Thank you for calling in. Okay, shalom. Shalom. So it's it's an interesting thing to see, and it's it's neat to read. A lot of times, the body of Messiah as a whole, we've kind of adulterated, uh, or or really in in respect to replacement theology, we've we've bastardized the Word of God, and we've taken away the Jewish context, the Jewish heritage, the Jewish reality of what's being written. And and you got to understand, we keep saying Jewish, you know, the Jewish kind of Jewish heritage. That's not to say that there was anything special about Jews. I mean, Abraham was just another guy, and before God called him, he was just 
another guy. Of course, he wasn't Jewish, was he? Exactly. He, as a matter of fact, when God called him, he was just another guy. Yeah. He became a, a Hebrew. He became a Hebrew and uh, an Hebrew. Hebrew when he yeah. crossed over, which is what that term means. He crossed over yeah. from paganism to to serving the God of all creation. What we know as 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 Hebrews, as Judaism, as the Jewish people, are the descendants of Abraham. Those that came after him, Isaac and Jacob, the people of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and Judaism has always contained both Jew and non-Jew. As a matter of fact, some of the greatest uh, rabbinical sages of the day were proselytes who came from the Gentile world, became uh, converts to Judaism, and buried their nose in the Word of God, and became a, a major part and factor of what Judaism There's is today. There's Gentiles within the lineage of Messiah. Exactly. There's Gentiles within... Not only is there Gentiles in the lineage of Messiah, one of my favorite things about the lineage of Messiah is it shows us how even some of the most despicable scenarios in our lives, the things that we've done, that a lot of of us will look at and go, how could anybody, much less God, love me after doing this? But the four women mentioned in the narrative of Yeshua's uh, lineage, the four women mentioned all were of questionable uh, sexual uh, uh, conduct all the way through. And so, and not only that, but one of them was a Moabite, Ruth, who yeah. the Moabites would say can never be a part of Israel. Not only does she become a part of Israel, but she becomes a part of the lineage of King David and Messiah himself. Still, what, third or fourth generation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, tenth generation. Li- oh, but, yeah, okay. but the reality is, is that as all of this was done was this Moabite who was, was, you know, the Moabites were despicable in God's eyes because what they did to Israel in the wilderness, all of this happening, here's a Moabite who's a woman and, and, and in many cases is considered uh, questionable in some of her actions but here's a woman who's a Moabite who's in the lineage of King David, of uh, Melech David, uh, of Melech Shlomo and ultimately in the, the lineage of Messiah Yeshua and so you have these women who are uh, in terms of, they're questionable in their conduct who become a part of the lineage and it just goes to show us that whether we're Jew or we're Gentile, whether we're um, decent people before we come to faith or we're just horrible you know, gutter trash before we come to faith, the reality is, is God can use all of us. And we're all a part of the message of Messiah in the sense that God uses our lives where he brought us from and where he's taking us to to minister to others' lives in ways that it changes, transforms, and impacts them. Yeah, the reality is, is we're all dirt. He created us from dirt. And we were laying there totally dead like Adam was in the garden until he breathed the Ruach. Correct. And he became a living soul. Yep. That's why the Ruach is so yep. important in our lives. Yep, that Ruach Ha'il, the breath of life, yes. which is the same, I believe, the same as the Ruach HaKodesh, the yes. same spirit, the same breath that he breathed over and into us and the infilling of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit that is given to us. That Ruach Ha'il, that breath of life, spoke the words of life into existence in the Bible itself. And that Ruach Ha'il, that Ruach HaKodesh, that breath of life, that Holy Spirit is what in inspires us to live out our lives as we walk this life of faith in Messiah. Well, Rabbi David, we're starting to start run out of time here, but I want to do something we usually don't do on this program. We do it before. I actually want to, I feel led to pray a prayer over the air right now. Abba Father, we come to you and we thank you for the opportunity, the, the privilege as humble servants of yours, Father, to be able to share your good news with the Jew and with the Gentile. And I just pray right now for our, our rabbi friends that are, are, are not accepting Messiah, have not accepted Messiah yet, that Father, the power of your Ruach HaKadosh, HaKadosh would begin to fall upon them in such a mighty way, Father, that they will realize and begin their eyes to finally be opened and see Messiah and lead their people to Messiah. And I pray for the pastors whose eyes have been shut, they've been in, in, ingrained in uh, replacement theology, that their eyes would begin to be opened as well, and they would begin to return back to the true covenant, to the way that you do things in the end of days, Father, and realize that we're all one. We're in this together. We say we believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then we have to believe in his Messiah, Yeshua. Help us, Father. Help us all do that and to begin to come together as the time of the end is approaching. As things get darker, you're separating the gray areas, removing them, uh, the, the lukewarmness, and you're bringing those who want to truly serve you into the fullness of your light. And those who are going to reject you are going to go into outer and utter darkness. Abba, I just ask you to move mightily in that, and we want to thank you for that in Yeshua's name. Amen. Now, we've got a couple of minutes, I think, left. Oh, we've got one minute left. So I want to thank you, Rabbi 
Uh, David, for being on the program today. It's been such a blessing. I've had a great time with you here today. And I want to thank the listeners who have been listening. And we pray that you truly be blessed and that challenge you to get in your word and to see God's face and allow him to fill you with his spirit if he hasn't already done so. Uh, we like to say Shavua Tov and Shalom. was true light which gives light to all in the world the new descendant